From the center of the galaxy, this is Force Center, a show about Star Wars, pop culture, and the ultimate adventure. Trailers dropping and emails right as you press record. I'm Ken Napsok. I'm Joseph. Here comes the news, Scrimshaw. I'm Jennifer Landa, and I'm glad that we didn't do a reaction video because I was like, ah, what? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the scoop. We have a big discussion planned today about when everyone has the Force. It's a great topic we've been waiting to discuss. But for those who follow Force Center and have for a while, uh, thank you, number one. Two, uh, you, know the, you know the rules. We record an episode on Monday. We release it, and Lucasfilm releases Star Wars news. Well, today, <laughs> Lucasfilm bucked the trend because uh, they, as literally, as we all gathered in this virtual studio, emails came across. The trailer for Bad Batch Season 3 was dropped. So we are going to do a little bit of reaction, discuss some of the emotion, uh, emotions of it, and, and, and Joseph, I'll let you explain maybe some of the... The bigger plan, but I do want to say every episode, as always, is brought to you by Audible. That's right. Uh, you get a free audiobook <laughs> download and a 30-day free trial at audible.com slash force center. Audibletrial.com slash force center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. I love doing ads. It's part of life. I was watching a documentary. There's a great ch a YouTube channel called uh, Oversimplified History, and I was watching the, the Punic War. And right, he works in the commercials so well. They're cliffhangers to the Punic War. Does Carthage or Rome win? You'll find out after this ad, so. Wow, <laughs> anyway. Anyways, Joseph, explain a little bit, Wanu, uh, about what's going on right now. Well, I'll, I'll tell you right now, speaking of ads, we're probably gonna change the book we're recommending for Audible, uh, because there's some uh, a book connection to the trailer that dropped. Uh, this was this was great. Uh, you know, we, we come into our little uh, stream yard here, and Ken was just staring at his computer and didn't even say hello. I was like, how rude. And <laughs> He's like, rude. I'm watching the trailer. Like, what trailer? That's how I discovered there was a, a new trailer for the Bad Batch. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to discuss the Bad Batch trailer uh, just a, a little bit here at the top of this episode. And then uh, on Tuesday, known as tomorrow in this uh, timeline, uh, Tuesday, January 23rd at 1130 a.m. Pacific, uh, Ken and I are going to do a live stream Bad Batch uh, season three trailer discussion. So we can uh, dive a little bit uh, deeper. We can take your questions. Uh, Jennifer has not entirely caught up with Bad Batch. Uh, so many of us Star Wars fans are not entirely caught up with anything except for, hey, the movies. Uh, so Ken and I uh, deeply love Bad Batch. We're going to dive a little bit deeper, but we're going to discuss it a little bit now uh, here. Instant reaction. So Jennifer, uh, your instant reaction was to the thing that I think most uh, people will be talking about, which was a character popping up toward the end of the trailer. Spoilers now for the Bad Batch trailer. Uh, Jennifer, what was your reaction to this character and why? I was really excited because prior to that, I was sitting there, well, I was like, okay, what what's happening? I was been because <laughs> I watched the first episode of the second season of Bad Batch and I really enjoyed it, but I just have a lot, you know, I, I watch other things like the Barbie movie finally, a little bit late on that. So anyways, I saw, I heard Asajj's voice I had the captions on. That's always helpful. And I was thrilled. And then I immediately assumed it was a flashback. Uh, mm -hmm. But then you all reminded me that there's stuff that's been happening in uh, Dark Disciple that I did not read. I'm familiar <laughs> with the book a little bit. And I'm like, oh, shoot. Okay, so now I have two things to catch up on. <laughs> Uh, but I'm work. excited. I'm excited. It's, it's going to be really fun to get back into this world. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you are just like, hey, I haven't seen that trailer yet. What are they talking about? A uh, wonderful trailer uh, for Bad Batch following up on the themes, uh, where we left the characters, the things they're concerned about at the end of season two, and uh, some other great, uh, hey, there's Fennec, there's Cad Bane. Uh, but then uh, at the end, there was Asajj Ventress. And uh, Ken, let me, I've never, ever wanted to do trailer reactions because mm -hmm. as you and I discuss, yeah have discussed sometimes we're very very straight faced uh <laughs> my my parents used to worry about me because i loved watching cheers but uh for video people this is how i watched it that was a good joke but it, i was studying it i was right. i was thinking yeah. about it and my thinking brain was going not my like having fun with friends at the bar face uh asaj pops up this is the first time i actually said yay out loud <laughs> mm, mm, mm. uh it's like oh maybe we can do trailer reactions we're not gonna um go. but my process was oh that's great more time with asaj wait mm -hmm. right would this be a flashback 
uh, and mm -hmm. I'm sure this discourse is going on everywhere and uh, sites have already been formed. Uh, there's already <laughs> screenshots with things circled. Uh, fr from my quick examination, uh, mm -hmm. it does indeed look like she is facing the clones with uh, our, their modern armor, but that, of course, could be trailer magic. Uh, this mm -hmm. is also spoilers for the book Dark Disciple. So if you don't want any spoilers about Dark Disciple or Asajj Ventress, uh, fast forward five minutes. Or the uh, end of the Clone Wars. <laughs> or the end of the Clone Wars. <laughs> or Bad Batch Season 2. Um, yeah. We'll try yeah. to keep those spoilers light. Anyway, uh, it, it seems like the great discussion, Ken, is going to be a uh, flashback to earlier in the clones' lives when Asajj was working as a bounty hunter during the Clone Wars. Or could uh, another character have survived what appears to be their demise in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And we could therefore get much more quality time, quality storytelling with uh, bounty hunter Asajj Ventress, who has found her own footing and is making her own choices, her own way in the galaxy. Uh, what was your emotional journey seeing Asajj and going flashback? I, more Asajj in, in different yeah. timeline? I, 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 I think it's important to go to those gut reactions that we all might have. Mm -hmm. I, I got excited. I would I, you that would, you we I trailer reactions are the bane of my creative existence <laughs> as well. But you guys kind of saw my reaction because I literally went, Ooh. oh, 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 and you had, you both hadn't watched it, so I, I shut my mouth. I actually removed myself from Streamyard to finish watching it. Um, so it was excitement. It was like, oh God, that's a great character. I'd love to see her in this uh, timeline. And then then you start doing the math and. I, I, I just want to focus on the fun of it. I think there's some – Alex Damon texted me immediately and was like, oh, here comes the Dark Disciple discourse. And and that's true. And I think it's important discourse to have if if she, in fact, is alive. And the the moments of that book, which, you know, Christy Golden wrote a, a great, well-received book based on Katie Lucas's unproduced Clone Wars scripts. I think it's a great story. Uh, there's always discussions to have around the stories and what's in the stories and all that kind of stuff. But I, I think it's 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 well received. It has it has a pretty solid, you know, ending in terms of what happens. And if if we're moving past that and going against that and reworking it, maybe we do have the discussion. Maybe are we in the canon level era of of new Star Wars? Are we back to A, B, C, and D and uh, you know detours canon? Like that's that's a discussion maybe to have. But I think you're right. I mean, a flashback or a scene that's not necessarily just even a flashback, like a do 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 do, but just we start the story somewhere else. She warns them about what might happen. There's things she information she could give a clone team at that time. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of possibilities, and I just want to keep in that excited frame of mind to discover what those possibilities are because I love this character and I think it's valuable to have her around. Yeah, I mean, I think pulling back to like the biggest picture for me is like more time with the character is phenomenal. A flashback would would be great. Um, to to spend some time with that character, to see her with uh, her her uh, more self realized <laughs> bounty hunter look yeah. away from Dooku, making her own yeah. life choices away from the Sith. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the hair is cool, the lightsaber is cool. Just more quality time with the character is cool. If that's what it is, wonderful, uh, great. If the character uh, did survive the events of Dark Disciple, yes, I, I, I can see what you're saying, Ken. There's the tension of like. Are they going to change an event from a from a book? Mm -hmm. If they didn't change the actual event, if it was, you know, like Maul, hey, we, we thought this character was gone, but turns out, nope, they are not. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow, mm -hmm. Asajj Ventress returned. <laughs> this course uh, begins. All, all that for me is like, yep, th all those are valuable discussions. Different people are going to feel strongly. What I care about most in the big picture is... Star Wars is a, a myth that presents us with characters where we can see different sides of ourselves, different sides of our experiences, different sides of other people in the real world's life experiences. And I think people gravitate toward uh, Asajj because she has a really important story of someone who is cool and deadly and, it, you know, the sort of classic femme fatale. But then we dive deeper with Katie Lucas's writing, and she's this trauma survivor caught between different worlds. And we finally get to see her in a place where she's making choices for, for herself. Spending more time with that character is more valuable to me than did they change some canon from a book. Are too many characters surviving after their apparent demise? Those things are important. They're interesting. But for me, the most important thing is the character's amazing. 
and I would love to spend more time with her. Which makes me wonder story wise, which is what I was trying to figure out after you guys told me about the dark <laughs> cycle stuff it immediately I'm like, Oh, it's a flashback. It's a cameo. It's a way to be like, Hey, remember this character that you liked? She's in this show. If you haven't watched bad batch, right? Uh, maybe she has a, a, a pivotal scene, pivotal episode, but if she is alive and they are going to feature her, well, that whets my appetite and get, I want more of her, which mm. then makes me think, is this an intentional move? Because they are going to build something with her. Could she mm. potentially appear in live action somewhere? Like that's where I start spiraling out of control because it's like, Oh, you're, you're going to give me a taste. Well, I want, you can't just give me one chip. I want the whole bag, right? I want the whole <laughs> adventures bag. So uh, that's why I'm like, uh, they know, they know what we want. They're just going to give mm -hmm. us a, a little taste with maybe like a flashback scene or whatever. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe it's going to be the era of Asajj Ventress. Mm -hmm. it, it could be. In, in, in terms of uh, just this season, the show, I would expect it to go the way even you're describing, Jen, of, of she's there for a very key moment, maybe a very key episode. We kind of saw that in the trailer going into season two, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, you know, certain characters are in the trailer and everyone goes, yes, and they have a wonderful episode, right? Uh, and, and I think I'm not expecting her to be much more than that. But to what you're saying, the excitement for this character, Joseph, what you're saying, which ties into something that, Jen, you had been covering on this channel almost 10 years ago about the excellent work of Katie Lucas to take a character, and this isn't a, a shade at the original Clone Wars, the, the Gendi uh, Tartakovsky stuff, take a character that might be surface cool, surface Star Wars awesome, because it was, and added some real world depth to the story. Uh, to, to marry that and spend more time with this character in any way, shape, or form is the value I'm going to focus on there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think she fits in with the world of Bad Batch if it's a flashback or if it's uh, moving forward because mm -hmm. part of what we've loved about Bad Batch is it's a trauma tour. It's a tour of what is the real <laughs> impact of yes. the Empire in every way from like a little <laughs> village, a big planet that thought they were totally safe from the Empire to clones who were, you know, serving it, it, to, to you know, y young Jedi Padawan who, who, are, who are now adrift uh, because mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a tour of how everybody is truly impacted by horrible authoritarianism. Yes. And Sash Ventress is totally uh, like, raise my hand, like, or, are we talking about trauma inflicted by authoritarians? <laughs> uh, I have some thoughts. Right. Uh, if she's a flashback or moving forward, the character so fits very importantly into the discussion of that mm. show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's 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 you know I keep saying Bad Batch season two right now is like my favorite season of Star Wars television and and, and you're you're really capturing why like Ken why do you like it <laughs> everyone's in a horrible state and they're trying to push through <laughs> it's great it is <laughs> they're they're finding hope in the most horrible times and yeah and that's that's what's powerful yeah. about it yeah and 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 it is also this is really a, definitely a sort of a check yourself before you wreck yourself. It absolutely could be a flashback, and that could be yeah, and it could be a flashback, and she could be in the episode for five minutes. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it my, my my final thought on, on that, and we can get some quick general reactions and, and move on our discussion, I suppose. But is is the uh, don't forget it, if you're starting some ventures discords, the the creators and people behind the show probably read that book. They know what's happened. <laughs> This wasn't just done because it was a character on a poster board that, now ah, let's just take this one down and throw it in. Uh, it was probably done with great purpose. So uh, at least give them the benefit of that doubt before screaming on the internet. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, th uh, the other thing that popped up in the trailer for me is uh, seeing uh, Fennec and Cad Bane, um, which there has been a lot of discussion, us included, of uh, wondering if Boba Fett will figure in, uh, mm -hmm. Omega being a, a potential sort of sister figure to Boba Fett. Uh, mm -hmm. They have been doing some work on uh, continuing resolving issues from the Clone Wars era, the Clone Wars animated series. There's the famous uh, Clone Wars episodes that were planned where, where Boba Fett gets his dad's armor and is kind of like fully baptized <laughs> into the world mm -hmm. of I am the Boba Fett that you know and there's been a lot of speculation of will Bad Batch feature Boba Fett feature that story Ken does just seeing Fennec and Cad Bane in the trailer make you feel like yeah we might actually finish Boba Fett's story and how it relates to yeah. Omega 
Honda watch is still pretty low, unfortunately. I think there's still one more chance for Honda to show up. Uh, the odds on Honda have gone down, but the FanDuel pick of Boba Fett going up, it's a, it might be a pick to click for me, I, I think. What uh, if that is Honda in an Asajj mask, I think? <laughs> Then That's... the entire internet would be united in being upset about it. If if you're at the sports book of the win, put that bet <laughs> down, kids, and you might be a millionaire by uh, the end of this series. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I it would see weird. And, and Jen, this is a great time. And I know we're unfortunately maybe getting some spoiler territory, but I think it's something that emerged in season one. Anyways, um, the idea of 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 not addressing in some way, shape, or form that Omega is essentially for lack of a better, more you know, distinct term, the sister of Boba Fett. Mm -hmm. I, it would seem incomplete if they didn't deal with it. Um, so, Jen, where does that where does that leave you with the excitement to go visit season two and run into season three? I feel like Winona Ryder on the stage. Remember, she's like looking around. I'm like trying to remember all these pieces. It's been a while since I saw it. <laughs> season one, uh, certainly season two. And I, it's really hard for me to wrap my head around this. I'll be honest. I mean, but listen, it's yeah. fun. It's fun. And like putting those pieces together. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have to really think about that. Does, does that make me David Harbour and Joseph Paul Reiser or Matthew Modine? <laughs> Cause I, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. If you are Joseph, I think it's <laughs> I'll, I'll go Matthew Modine, but besides that, yeah, yeah I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> no, no hate on Paul Reiser. Um, yeah, we can, I think, talk about the rest uh more maybe more depth tomorrow ken i'll just say like yeah. for for the those are the shiny things what could these sort of cameos or one-off episode appearances mean but for the heart of the series the clones that we've been following i love that so much of it was centered on the idea of we are ready to be done with fighting mm -hmm. we are ready to be done with the war but our mission isn't over yet and the sort of through line of these clones that we've been following the bad batch and all clones with, with Rex in there too, really coming to terms with, we were, we were born to be warriors, but we didn't get to choose the war we fought. And now we are defining how we want to end our battle and, and get out of the fray is it's, it's so, it's so powerful. It's a story about, you know, reclaiming your purpose and about accepting that the, the bad things about your heritage and the good things about this is intrinsically who I am and I believe in myself. All that stuff that makes Bad Batch beautiful was so present in the trailer. Yeah, well said. Uh, we get to decide what to do with tomorrow. And 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 I think tomorrow, when you and I discuss this, I think one of the things we'll be looking at is this trailer with some big, shiny things you said. And not let's not overlook Ian McDiarmid back in another great moment of the, with the Emperor. Holy moly. Uh, this seems like it's setting up a rather personal, intimate season, right? It's it's mm -hmm. about the, 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 the clones, the family, Omega. It's all those things and deciding to fight for. So, uh, yeah, good table set for to a deeper discussion, but loved. Uh, and plus the action. It's another thing I love with this. Uh, series as well. Yep, yep. It mixes the, the the trauma tour with just some great Star Wars pulp, you know, cliffhanger adventure. There's a literal cliff on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, we will uh, talk more about that tomorrow. And Ken, we should also plug our live stream at the end of this coming week. That's right. Uh, our monthly live stream is going to be this Friday. That is, uh, what is that? The 26th. I, I so don't look at calendars like I should anymore, but it's Friday, 26, 2 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we'll be hanging out uh, and uh, hopefully you're all there. I'm sure we'll have some great questions. As always, we'll take questions from all over the world, meaning literally uh, pop culture, life, those kind of things. But uh, the focus on Star Wars uh, will be uh, very much... Uh, uh, there as we probably still talk about this trailer and the discourse around Asajj Ventress. Exactly. So uh, again, on Tuesday, 11.30 a.m. Pacific, you can join Ken and I for the Bad Batch Season 3 trailer live stream. And then, of course, on Friday, should we dive into our main topic then? Let's do it. All right. Uh, when everyone has the force. A book report. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, it's just the way I said that. No. Anyway, teacher, here are my thoughts. Anyway, one of the big ideas of Ahsoka that we've been having so much uh, fun kind of separating out the characters, the ideas, but one of the biggest ideas of Ahsoka is that everyone does indeed have the Force. Uh, Lucas and Filoni have both discussed this in interviews over the years, but the Ahsoka series made it explicit in the storytelling. Huyang and Ahsoka both do clarify that talent does matter, but with patience and training, everyone, in theory, could access the Force up to some point. 
we'll talk about Sabine specifically, but we also want to talk about this idea in the bigger picture, starting with our, our youth. Uh, our perspectives often do determine our reality, and we try to own when we grew up, and we love hearing uh, from, from you in, in comments, everybody watching and listening, of uh, how you were affected based on what you saw first and all that kind of thing. So, Jennifer, when, when you were a kid, growing up with the original trilogy, how did you interpret the force when, when there wasn't, a, you know, a bunch of uh, opinions and, and essays on the Internet that didn't exist yet? Uh, did you think other people had the force besides Luke, Kenobi, Vader, Leia? It really felt like a small group of superheroes, right? Like a really, mm -hmm. these, these are special. I mean, the chosen one, right? The hero, the hero's journey of Luke. Like it just felt like this is just a, a little slice of it. And even though in theory, I could have thought that there were more as a kid, I, I just couldn't really comprehend that. It was all about this family, you know? And for mm -hmm. me, it's like, oh, the fact that Leia has it. Ooh, okay. Like that was, it was just like, this is, yeah, this is like a very, like a, a, a monarchy or whatever, you know, like this, this is a very special <laughs> royal family. that mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and if anybody's, you know, uh, having a strong reaction to that, we're definitely going to talk about that. The, uh, the dynastic uh, interpretation dynastic. Thank of, you. of Star Wars or yeah, no. Um, Ken, how did, how did you feel growing up, uh, pre-internet when you had nothing but your imagination and maybe a couple of your friends to bicker with on the playground? Uh, mm -hmm. did, did you feel like everyone had the force? Yeah. And I, Jen, you're pitching like Lord's song Royals in Star Wars. I, I, I like it here. Um, <laughs> exactly. yeah, uh, I went with, it was new hope through a wrinkle in it. I think overall I thought it, it was something Luke had. It was something Vader slash Anakin had. And then we learned Leia had it. And even that was kind of like, but well, I get, you know, Empire, she does close her eyes and feel things. Uh, and it felt like it was this small corner, but mm -hmm. because of a new hope where they all, everyone says, may the force be with you through the, for, for the, throughout the first three movies. But in New Hope, it just seemed to be more present. It seemed to everyone, Jan Dodonna being the first to say, may the force be with you. To have everyone else kind of be like, yeah, yeah, the, the force. Oh, this kid's got the force. Yay. You know, you know, and it seemed like everyone knew it and everyone knew Luke was it. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not even saying that sticks with me throughout my existence, but that's kind of where I floated around into your question, Joseph, in the 80s, of it was something only a few could get. But everyone understood it and everyone wanted to, practice the principles of it, I felt. It, it, it was a little bit why the conversation around balance was maybe hard to understand in my younger days because it just seemed like, no, the force was rooting for one side. Didn't you hear? Didn't you see? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of what I took going forward for a little bit. Yeah, I think I think if from a little kid perspective, I got that, oh, it's it's natural. It connects everyone and everything. It, it's everywhere it, mm -hmm. that, it, you know, that it wasn't exclusive, but the ability to access it did seem exclusive and that's what the story was about luke was mm -hmm. you know th the new hope the only hope and i think for me the there is another talk and, and being mm -hmm. just old enough to spend the years between empire strikes back and return of the jedi going like it's a murder mystery who is the other and my, my mm -hmm. brother and i debated like lando chewy you know i i think we we <laughs> it's, it's yes it's very funny to watch from a modern perspective. Like, well, yeah, it's Leia. I mean, there's no mystery. <laughs> like, right. if, if, you know, if they did that in a modern movie and, and Leia closed her eyes at the end of Empire and like, I know where Luke is. And it would be like, yeah, the other's Leia. It's, it's, it's <laughs> blindingly <laughs> obvious. Right. Uh, but, you know, we used to debate who that other was. But, but the talk yeah. of the only hope and the other, it felt to me like the philosophy of the Force is that it's everywhere. But this idea of being able to access it and use it and, and, and turn it into abilities uh, mm -hmm. felt um, felt very specific and unique. I think I also, I'm just going to own my my bias. There was all sorts of Luke. Are you a Luke? Are you a Han? Mm. My brother was Han. Mm. I was Luke. Um, before Return of the Jedi and the sibling revelation, it, it was sent, one of the big questions that kids would talk about is, is Leia going to choose Luke or Han? Uh, mm -hmm. That was a discussion mm -hmm. that I had. And I always felt like, well, I think she should, she should choose Luke. But I was like, but she's going to choose Han because he, he has it all. He's charming. He's got a cool ship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think a part of my like force bias was it didn't seem like Luke was getting this, you know, exclusive power from my little kid perspective. It felt like, 
Han has everything, and most kids like Han better. Can Luke have <laughs> one damn thing that's his? Can he win once? Can he have the Force? They're like, I, if Return of the Jedi came out and Han was like, ah, I can use the Force too, I'd be like, come on! <laughs> that would have been my little kid perspective of the way I was yeah. sort of processing it all through my own life. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, look, I carry that a little bit, like a tiny bit of it even to, into now. We'll, we'll probably come up later. But yeah, I, I think that's just because owning our perspective and owning our yeah. experience and journey. But uh, I want to ask this follow-up question. Nothing about the storytelling of the original trilogy ever made me feel like excluded in this idea. Like Luke is a noble, a royal, and the force is only for special people, not you kid. Mm. Mm -hmm. Worry of Luke being that he is a farmer from nowhere that no one thinks is special mm. always felt to me like I'm supposed to identify with Luke. Everyone is supposed to identify yeah, with yeah, Luke. Yeah, yeah. The message of the films always felt to me that anybody can could everybody has something as special as Luke does. Mm -hmm. You know, it never mm -hmm. felt to me like a story about not you, kid, only the special one, <laughs> only a rich mm -hmm. name. It never. How do yeah. you feel about like Ken? How did you re receive the message of the film? I think you're 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 right. Uh, you know, it might have inspired me to to believe I could be a baseball player, which. Um, the sports analogy might come up in this episode because that that famous got a Lucas reference of of anyone can you know train but only if you have the super skills. I, I took it as inspirational, and and I, I don't mean to cast any any uh, aspersions on 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 sequel conversations and those who have a, a kind of that issue of of the Skywalker Royals uh, or mm -hmm. or Ray and and and, and every, uh, you know the idea that everyone can touch it and everyone can have it is something I'm on board with. But I, I, I didn't take, again, it's my perspective and journey. I, I own that. But like, I didn't take offense that there was any suggestion that it was just Ray. Fan Poe, they, they were, it, anyone, it, Ray, she's the only one touched with this magic power. I, I, I don't take offense to that. I take inspiration from it because of what you're describing about Luke's journey. And I'm not saying yeah. I'm right, they're wrong. I'm just, it's a different time. It's a way we discuss things a lot more, you know, just as a fandom, a lot more detailed and deep than we used to. But I, I was with you. That could be me. I'm from a small town. I, I could have some power inside me. And that's what I took from it. I really honestly did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I tried to use the force. I tried to move sticks with my mind because it was so like any anybody can do it because because luke is the underdog jennifer uh, a did you ever try to move sticks with your mind did you ever try to have the force yes <laughs> and 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 did you did you relate did you see yourself in luke did you feel like the message of these films is everybody is important luke is looked on as a nobody but he is he's special and maybe i could be special too yeah, I think I think it was very inspirational for me. I saw myself a lot in Luke in that he had this special ability. And Ken, like you, I thought I was going to be an actor when I was a kid, a very successful actor. Uh, and because I was, you know, I had this ability. And like, look at Luke, he came from this farm, this farm boy, you know, he was, he didn't even know that this existed within him, right? And mm, one day he yeah. had this awakening. And that was his destiny. I was very much when I was younger, mm -hmm even not so long ago, a real believer in like, what is your destiny? That was mm -hmm. his. So I never really kind of got up, caught up in the idea that he it was like this, like, you know, the royals, uh, as you were mm -hmm. saying. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Yeah, I think it's just fascinating uh, to to discuss the entire storytelling of Star Wars as we know it now versus mm -hmm. what what people our age experienced with just those first three films. And I think mm -hmm. what what mm -hmm. we're all agreeing on is there nothing felt exclusionary about those three films, but maybe it does as the Star Wars story, you know, evolves. Right. Right, uh, but right, that's, right. I think, want to own our perspective. So jumping forward, the prequels come out and, and the force became tied to the idea of midi-chlorians, microscopic life forms living in solid, all living cells that speak to us of the force. Uh, in my opinion, it, it is a more scientific version of, of what Obi-Wan and Yoda said. It, it It's in all of us. It's in all of nature. It's connect. It connects everything. But now is this more, um, you know, a, a quantifiable version of it. Ken, did the did the midi-chlorians discussion revelation change your thinking about the force being available to everyone? Uh, it did. It did a little bit, and, and I think I'm in a, a way better spot. I was I was part of the the audience that might have been like, "Huh," when when that 
all was first said, and I, obviously there was great pushback against it, and there still might be of making uh, of Neil deGrasse Tysoning magic, you know, of trying to explain it. But as as time has gone on, and some of those Clone Wars episodes that you know, that Mortis and just Yoda on his dark, uh, long dark tea time of the soul, uh, it, there's a mystical side to it that I really appreciate, and I don't think it was just dry science trying to explain it. I think I think George had some great thoughts behind it and ideas, and just wanted to ex- explore it. Uh, so I've followed a lot more. But to your point too, it's just like, oh, okay, there's some levels inside all of us. We gotta go get you gotta take your shick raver your shick uh, razor and, and test your blood and have Qui Gon do it. <laughs> and 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 you and, 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 and you might know what you're capable of. And 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 I'd even take it as a power ranking, something that will probably come up for conversation here today. Uh, you know, that idea. It just it 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 was more interesting as time gone on. But I, I can't lie and say nineteen ninety nine, I thought it was just wonderful that Anakin was off the charts with this science. Mm-hmm. Jennifer, how, how was your midi chlorian journey and did it affect the way you thought about who has access to the force? Yeah, I think initially I was one of those people as well that was like, what? Because anything with like biology and science, I'm like, oh, okay. And like, I love the mysticism of it. I, you don't need to explain yeah. it to me. I will believe it. I want to have faith in it, right? So that to me, and then it also felt like, when I got introduced to this idea with the prequels, I kind of had a little bit of a reaction where it felt like Anakin was Jesus Christ, right? <laughs> and where I was just like, mm. That's and not subtle. It's um, not subtle, and right? It's Darth not subtle. Maul's visage did not, uh, you know, dissuade you from having a, you know, specific mm-hmm. kind of uh, religion interpretation mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. the hero is a, a miracle birth and, and the villains Immaculate got some conception. Satan vibes, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Right, exactly. And then that's when I was like, oh, this does feel like it very much is like this dynasty. But the thing about the midichlorians is that now looking at it, I don't think that at all. I think it's wonderful that, you know, anybody could have the force because they have, you know, a lot of midichlorian, high midichlorian count. And I think it it opens a story up more as opposed to how I think I thought of it when I was younger, where it's about the bloodline. It's one of mm. the reasons I don't like that Ray is a Palpatine. I really wanted her to be a nobody. I thought that was a really important story to tell which we'll get in later. Um, <laughs> but I think having the midichlorians opens that up so that anybody can be, you know, a, a Jedi. Yeah. Or, or uh, how, you know, be able to use a force, excuse me. Yeah, I, I, I love what you're both saying. I think I had the immediate kickback because it was a change in my perception of just the way we talked about it. Yeah. I, I think yeah. that's where I came around to. is like, you know, the midichlorian thing just adds some nuance and some perspective and some other ways to look at it. It doesn't change anything that Obi-Wan or Yoda said in the original trilogy to me, Obi-Wan and Yoda just said it in a much more mystical way. Mm-hmm. And the, the midi-chlorians and, and doing a, a blood count uh, with a, mm-hmm. you know, a, a razor that can transmit blood samples across space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or transmits the readings of them at least. Um, I think I had that initial kickback of this is, you know, overly scientific. This is a power ranking. It's function in the movie is to say, there's no doubt this kid has a huge amount of natural talent. There's no doubt about it. But the more I fell in love with the prequels and, and the more I got sort of um, frustrated with Gen X repeating the same criticisms of the Phantom Menace and the prequels mm-hmm. ag- again and again, the more I felt like, you know, people saying, well, it's just science now. It's like, really? Microscopic beings mm-hmm. that know the will of an energy field that connects us all whispering in our blood. <laughs> That's science. I mean, it is, but you know, yeah. it, it's, it's so mystical. And as, as you're saying, Ken, it's explored in the clone wars with uh, mm-hmm. Yoda's journey uh, and all that. So I, I think once I got past sort of like the bump of this is a different way to talk about it. I really like where that it leads us to where we got with Sabine is. Yeah talent matters you know there is a you might be able to do a, a ranking system of blood and we might be able to say anakin has a higher midi chlorine count than anybody and sabine your midi chlorine count is for bleep mm-hmm. but that's not that's that's talent that's the mm-hmm. sort of base level it's not mm-hmm. talking about you know how hard you work it's not talking about the way you apply the talents you do have i feel like the midi chlorines actually they could tip into just sort of no fun power ranking but I think they actually do set us up for a discussion of we're talking about net a natural amount of talent. Now, where do you go from there? 
Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and one and one of my final big thoughts on that is is when when you eventually kind of go to the text and the text of the original uh, trilogy, uh, that whole you said it, Yoda uh, talking about luminous beings and all that and crude matter, that whole wonderful sequence, that was just a wonderful poetic Kazdan way of explaining. I think what George came back in a more uh, direct way, which I, I don't mm -hmm. think uh, is bad. So yeah, that's where I eventually got with that. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we can get uh, caught up in the the canon of the Force, the lore, the the rules, how are you going to write it out in the rule book of a role-playing game, all that. But but uh, we should never lose the why, I think. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a, a big and important question, I think, for how we all process this. Uh, Jennifer, for you, what does the Force mean as an idea, uh, in analogy for anything in our world, like the storytelling of it what what is the force to you and why does it matter i think it's important to me because it, it forces uh, it's about having faith believing in something m bigger than yourself mm. it it takes the focus off of ourselves me 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 and the ego and it's like there is something else at play that i can tap into that can help me that i can help others it's this really beautiful thing which is actually now why i'm thinking about it you were talking about the midichlorians um, and the power levels I don't like that because mm. then immediately I'm like, well, Anakin's at the top and where is Sabine? And then <laughs> it's like, that's not the fun of it. The fun is like, how much can I, an everyday person, tap into this, move my salt and pepper shakers as I used to do, <laughs> try to do when I was a kid, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, and maybe it's because I grew up religious. So like, for me, it was like, I bought into it, no problem. I can, I could even believe in some crazy stuff now, even though I'm not as religious. But like, I, I, I just, I love that idea of the force um, and the mysticism of it. And don't explain it to me, just, just let me believe in it, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. And I think e even with some of Lucas's, I want to explore this more. There, there's so much Star Wars storytelling where Jedi are still like, well, it's, it's the unending mystery. The more we understand it, the more questions are raised. And I, I think there is plenty of Star Wars storytelling about the force that that keeps its ephemeral nature mm -hmm. al alive. Uh, what I'm really responding to with what you're saying, Jennifer, is uh, kind of this idea of more than the sum of our parts that. Right science can explain almost everything about our body. And, and I, I, um, uh, I grew up very l super lightly <laughs> religious. Uh, we only went to churches where half the service was uh, hippies playing Beatles songs. Uh, <laughs> uh, God bless the Jesus movement of the seventies. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, something, something is, uh, I think they probably played something. And that's a good force song. Uh, but, <laughs> but for me, I, I, I sometimes describe myself as is spiritual. I don't need a specific dogma attached to it. For me, my life experience is I believe science, but we also are, to me, more than the sum of our parts. Uh, mm -hmm. Science can't mm -hmm. quite put, uh, mm -hmm. can't quite explain everything in my mind. So mm -hmm. so there's that that sense that I have in my gut that we are more than the sum of our parts. And more than anything, with a lot of the storytelling around the Force itself, uh, I think one of the main points of the midi-chlorian was to support that theme in The Phantom Menace of the idea of, of symbiont, of we are all connected. We are all in this together. We wouldn't be able to know the Force without the midi-chlorians. To me, it is the same as what Yoda is describing, is it connects all of us. It it. it is between you and me and and the tree and you know it, it penetrates us and it binds us it means it it is in us it is of us but it connects us to everything else and for me just as a as an idea it's just like that's true and th there are so many philosophies where um the individual is promoted above all else or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know the 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 rules of the jungle you know the strongest survive so i'm gonna cut in front of you or <laughs> yeah. not care you know if if somebody else is in pain i got mine to me the force is sort of a pushback against that philosophy of we're all connected and the more we help one another the better for all of us um that's how i think about the force and then i'm going to pitch it to you ken but i also want to put a pin in there's a difference to me between interpreting the force and interpreting characters who can use force abilities mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so ken mm -hmm. how do you interpret the force how do you kind of uh, think about it 
I got there's a lot to catch up here. First of all, how did it go? <laughs> Something in the way he moves through you. I don't want to sin right now. I don't yeah. want to sin right now. Um, and Jen, man, let's take a swing through the satanic panic. Star oh. Wars was almost canceled in my house. There was grumbles and whispers behind my parents as they got me Star Wars toys because of mm. that darn Eastern mysticism. Coding right. the West's religion is the mm. only thing right. Um, and it's so interesting to have this discussion now where I think Star Wars the force represents a, a, a pure form of spirituality or religion even if you want to because and, and look it's, it's mileage may vary and it's how you take it take it all in i look at it right now in this day and age is the force kind of represents our relationship with with our own choices and the choice to be better and the choice to be better for those around you quite frankly joseph you're describing the force is socialism and i love it uh <laughs> we're, we're all plugged in we're right. all plugged in and right. do you get it yeah. Right? Do you get it? Do you get it that we're all here together? We all have uh, tiny and- union activists in every <laughs> cell to- of our body. <laughs> Union. They're chanting and they're trying to get through. Uh, Yoda's Robert Reich. Um, <laughs> look, um, uh, the old republic is is Eugene uh, uh, Debs. Um, look, I, I uh, jokes aside, like that's kind of where I'm at with it now. Where you mentioned the destiny of it all, Jen. My interpretation of destiny has been documented over this podcast is changing of this Mm. call for destiny kind of what you were saying i shall be a great baseball player oh i was cut from a high school team i don't know what i am (laughs) like and 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 it's really about the choices and the choices in front of you and the choice to be better tomorrow and the choice to plug in and empathy and compassion all those things it represents a beautiful thing to me and uh and just why you can plug into it in 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 various levels there's a we'll have a discussion about who who actually might be tapping into it and and they don't know uh sorry i always preview the questions to come because i get excited No, uh, so that's my that's my kind of relationship with what the force means now. Uh, I love it. I love it. I want to talk just a bit about abilities because I think you and I, you, you, you uh, and I, and Jennifer, we all we're all discussing um, the mm-hmm. force. Yeah, but that's different than than using it to throw a rock <laughs> or, a, or, or a Jedi mind trick. And I've always interpreted that everybody is connected to this. We're all connected to it. The the force abilities thing for me. Um, it got in young of relating to Luke and relating mm-hmm. to the idea that the for being able to use the force is like talents, which I truly believe we all have talents. We all have the force. We all have them different talents and in different levels that we can then perfect or not. But it, yeah. it was, it was, uh, it just dovetailed with my life experience. My dad is a phenomenal visual artist, just amazing. Um, and early on, I did not seek it out. I, I doodled in kindergarten and the teachers made a big deal of it because my doodles l- looked more like an actual dog than the other kids. Mm. Do. Mm. They just, they did. Mm. And people made a thing about it. And you, when, when I start really absorbing star Wars and it's like, you got this talent from your father. It's like, it's, it's, it's me. I got this raw talent from my dad. Mm-hmm. Now I see that as a raw talent of, I have, I can access this specific ability a little bit more easily because I inherited it from my bloodline. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now I could decide how much I want to practice it, hone it, refine it. And there, there are people who maybe didn't, don't, didn't Mm -hmm. get complimented for their doodles in kindergarten who are 10 million times better artists than I am. Cause I've spent zero time lately honing, perfecting, Mm -hmm. And mm-hmm. for me, that that's a way into thinking about the force and thinking about the midi chlorine count is a measuring device, but it, it doesn't matter. If Anakin never tried, mm-hmm. Sabine would be 10 times more powerful than him because she is honing, practicing, putting herself to it. Uh, Ken, how, does that make any sense to you? Do you look at it differently? I, the ability side of it. No, it does, because it even goes back to a little bit of what's at play and at stake in The Phantom Menace, the idea of visions and what what is going to happen because we got told or think it's going to happen versus uh, what do we, you know, what do we choose and what do we do with all this information, right? I, I agree with you, if, uh, you know. Anakin in that moment says, yeah, thanks, Qui-Gon, for the offer. I'm good. I'm sticking here. And, and Qui-Gon respects that. Those 20,000 chlor- muddy chlorians are now in a pod race again. You know, like <laughs> – 
that's where it's it. And, and I think it's a lot about that. And I, I love the story of what you're saying with your father's skills and what you have and what you choose to do to it. That uh, That's it. And, and, and it boils down like, you know, going back to the kid on the playground thing, I definitely know I've said the story. I'm your uncle at a party repeating himself, but I think it's <laughs> uh, appropriate to bring it up here where I, I would be on the playground and, and no one in my school wanted to uh, take on the part of, of Lando. <laughs> I could think of some bigger reasons why we'll discuss on another podcast, but uh, I would try to convince my friends because I was the jerk schedule. You know, you're playing this character, you're Wedge, you're the. I, I, I kept saying, well, Lando's got partial force powers. He can call a lightsaber to him. So you get that fun. Oh, okay. I'll be Lando now. Right. Uh, um, uh-huh. And I would, that, so that's how you kind of maybe interpret the force younger. Maybe that sticks with you to a certain, you know, a certain. Uh, yeah, certain on, on your path, maybe for a certain uh, time. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, the, the, it's definitely different. Definitely different. Force, abilities, what you do with it, what salt and pepper shakers you move. <laughs> Jennifer, how how do you think about force abilities as opposed to necessarily just the, the force itself? Where are you at with uh, how you process it all? Yeah, I think about it when I think this is where I start to become a stickler about the Sabine mm-hmm. thing, right? Because I do, <laughs> I do think that there is something to be said that they take the young leans, right? They take young kids and mm-hmm. they they train them. And the reason why is if you look at real children in our world, they can learn yeah. languages faster than an adult can, right? right. Their right. imaginations, that's why there's so many incredible young kid actors because Mm -hmm. they're prone to like have imaginative play it's easy for them to imagine a giant dinosaur is coming towards them right even though it's like Mm -hmm. a tennis ball so they don't use tennis balls anymore Mm -hmm. anyways uh the point is is that like there's something about their minds that are just more uh, flexible and so taking i think teenage years don't don't take a teenager hormones ego all this stuff that's really hard that's an uphill battle so Mm -hmm. I feel like for natural talent, if you take them when they're young, see who's going to work the hardest, then they'll weed themselves out. Just like with me with piano. Because I started young. I started (laughs) when I was five. And just same thing. Everyone's Mm -hmm. like, you're so talented. You're so talented. Well, then you're around a bunch of talented, really talented pianists who are practicing three, four hours a day. Mm -hmm. And real quickly, I'm like, I don't want to do that. I'm okay with just being where I am. I'm not going to be a Jedi. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be have, a piano Jedi. Yeah. Right. I may have force abilities, but I'm, I'm no Jedi master. So yeah. it's just the way that it is. But that's my yeah. feeling on, on talent. Uh, yeah. You know, like anything, if you want to become an Olympic athlete, most of those people have been doing it since they were kids. Same yeah. Thing with, same thing with the Jedi in my heart. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. I, I think that, that you're, you're tapping into a great thing about um, the idea of sort of faith, uh, we all, people often talk about Jennifer, like you mentioned, the the force itself is in sort of faith is something in something larger than us. But I feel like force abilities is almost faith in yourself. Mm-hmm. And when Yoda <laughs> says to Luke, "You must unlearn what you have learned," mm-hmm. I think he's talking about sort of rigid things about like the rock is smaller, so I can lift it. The X wing's big, I can't. But I think it's also just like the older you get, the more we fill ourselves with can'ts, don'ts, shouldn'ts. That's the not the way it works. And, and to have the sort of hubris to say, I can t- tap into the, the the reality of the cosmos and I can channel it through myself and I can be something, you know, extraordinary. It, it is like having the, the hubris or, or the faith to believe in yourself as an artist, to, to put yourself out there or to come up with a wild business plan or, or decide I'm 80, but I'm climbing that mountain. It's it's having this faith in yourself that I think younger people haven't been filled up with the, the can'ts and the don'ts. (laughs) They're like, I'll do that. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of the story of force abilities to me. And and that's fascinating for somebody like Sabine, who's gotta be loaded to the gills with can'ts and don'ts in Mm -hmm. rigidity and is fighting to find a way past that. Mm -hmm. Ken, how do you feel about that part of it? I I think for the one month time on a Star Wars podcast, someone will say, remember, George made this for 12 year olds, right? And Mm -hmm. and, uh, (laughs) meaning you are about, you know, give or take a year or two. That's when it starts to hit. Right. I remember being 13 before a play. 
uh, in which I was one of the stars. And I sat there and I said to myself for the first time, I think I'm depressed, right? Yeah, That's yeah. when it all, it's all starts rushing in, I think along, you know, mm -hmm. mileage may vary, experiences may, may vary, but that's around the time. And I think there's a lot to what George is putting in there into this, that, that, this idea. And I think he revisits it a little bit with, with the Phantom Menace and that era too, of just, yeah, you, you know, you're going to start saying you can't, you're going to start saying it's too big. You're going to start saying the thing I have inside me, the thing that's calling me forward, I just can't, it's too much. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and that's part of the mystical thing of it. You know, it turns into a little bit of Jedi dogma that we have fun de debating of let's get them young. But I think your point, Jen, your perspective as a parent, it's true. Not just that you can mold them into doing their chores, but uh, that you can, you know, hey, here's who you are. And and it's it, you have unfettered access to that self right now. Um, and, and the world's going to dump a lot of garbage in front of you on that path. But connect to it now. And I think that I think the force and the fun of the force and the ability to, it does tap into that stuff for me that's why it's still a valuable story for all all of us to learn from yeah no absolutely um so we want to be sure to talk about the the why in the depth but there's also the fun of getting into the like the the canon um i think uh it's it's interesting to me that in this this show in ahsoka who yang and ahsoka are quite clear that talent is a factor um, yeah. That the Jedi Order of old tracked down infants who were uh, who were expressing <laughs> force mm -hmm. abilities. They, they're they're, they're the things that we get to see. They're they're already throwing blocks with their mind and things like that. Um, Sabine's level of natural talent would not have been admitted into the Jedi Order. Who Yang is really clear about. Ken, mm -hmm. how do you? Uh, we've been talking a little bit already about the sort of the the natural talent part of accessing the force mm -hmm. as um, as metaphor as analogy. Uh, but how do you feel about it from a sort of canon Star Wars lore perspective? Does it help tie the storytelling together for you to say, like, yeah, the Jedi Vold would not have accepted Sabine, but this is a different time? How do, does it help you kind of make it, make it all make sense? It, it it does, and we'll get into the weeds a little bit uh, on the Sabine uh, character and some thoughts mm -hmm. I have on that in, in many directions. But uh, in terms of what you just said there, you know, the, tying the storytelling together, I think it pays off a lot of what Yoda was saying. Maybe it pays off a strong word, but you know what I mean? Like it, it, it references that. It's going back to that. It's going back to the core. It And it, it might, might challenge a little bit of what was going on in the order in the past. And I think that's okay. The order clearly needs to change because the order doesn't exist. And and I I, I like that. I, I like, because I think one of the big things that I, I like about the Ahsoka series, and I think key to the Ahsoka character is that question of what does it mean to be a Jedi and what does it mean to be a Jedi right now? And and Ahsoka, I think, comes to a point of, of you know, looking at that a little differently and that we need to. And, and she because of her experiences, we know why she's on that path. And some of the bickering and bantering with, with Hu Yang is, is a little bit about that, right? Right from the very beginning. I'm following Jedi orders. I'm following the strategies we've done for <laughs> thousands of years. And that wasn't wrong then, but maybe we have to look at it now. And I think a lot of that does filter down to the story of Sabine and what we're, what we're asking here. What does it mean to actually be a Jedi in this time? Yeah. Jennifer, how do you feel about it? Does it, do you feel like having those bits of information in the Ahsoka show uh, help make sense of the entire Star Wars story of like, oh, it, it, it makes sense that there are people at different levels of talent and even the Jedi Order were like, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. You know, I think it's I think it's very important. I think that they've been pretty crystal clear to why, you know, how your heart you have to you can be a great warrior. You can have the talent, but it's, it's accessing a different part of yourself, which is the challenge and what, what we see with Sabine. She is a badass, but now she's being required to use a different muscle than she's used mm. to. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like, oh, that's that's going to be an uphill battle for all the reasons that that we stated but yeah i think i think it makes total sense um yeah and i think this is why the, <laughs> that was the end. okay I, I think i think i think having some of that dialogue some of that perspective some of that idea is, is why the sort of the midi chlorian and the the power ranking doesn't bother me because it, it moves mm. it acknowledges it to me and moves the story past it of yep you can you can get your space razor and you can measure, but that's a measure of possibility. Jennifer, you, you might have been off the scales for Jedi pianist. Right. You didn't want to do it. it and, and this centers training and choice. And, you know, Filoni talks about in interviews again and again, how that was one of the big things that Lucas wanted to get across to him, that training is really important. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Filoni's talked about, we didn't, 
I didn't want Grogu to level up without him training because it was so right. important to George that that's part of this. You have to, you can have mm -hmm. natural talent, but you must train. So I like that it, it centers the, the training. I would just like to say, this is how I related to it. I'm going to bring an American Idol back when I used to watch it. <laughs> you see a lot of really great raw talent, but there is something about when they're week after week doing different genres. If they don't have the training, if they haven't been singing, whether it's in, you know, choir or, or in, in church or whatever it is, you can tell the performers that have that training because they're able to have that stamina. They're able to have that level of performance that you need. And mm -hmm. so that's how I, I look at it. I'm like, Sabine is, is a great, she can carry a tune. She's got a natural, nice voice, but now she's got to, to do her training to be able to perform in front of Simon Cowell. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily need to be, she has to go to Juilliard, AKA no, the no. Jedi order of old. She's got to, right. you know, right. find her own, her own path, her own exactly. repetition, her own practice. I, the other thing for me very quickly is just, I think on the publishing side in particular, uh, there's been lots of great exploration of, of people who are sort of force aware. Um, mm, yeah, yeah. Maz Kanata being like, eh, I can feel it, but I can't control yeah, this. Obviously yeah. in Force Awakens, but in, in the Catalyst novel, Jin's mother, Lyra Urso, is really like, I cannot, I cannot train. I cannot move things with my mind, but I can sense across the galaxy that something horrible happened. Mm -hmm. um, like these different mm -hmm. levels of engagement. I think the, the Jedi and the High Republic uh, storytelling have been doing a really good job of have finding characters who feel like I'm not good at all the standard Jedi stuff. I'm just not, but I'm really great at this one thing. And mm -hmm. it's about expressing talent in lots of different ways. And that to me is really connected to the real world and, and democratic and beautiful. We don't all have to be equally talented at, at things. Uh, what matters to me is that we are all talented in our, in our own ways. And yeah, yeah, I like Sheard that. Amway. Sheard Amway is a great example of that yep. too. I think oh, wonderful. Yeah, right. yeah exactly, right. exactly. Uh, so we've also talked a little bit about this, but I want to dive in the difference between having the Force and being a Jedi, because I think sometimes uh, when fans are kind of talking about it fast and loose, it can be like, oh, so anybody can be a Jedi now? Like, eh, no, everybody has the potential to access the Force. <laughs> uh, but Ken, for you, wh what's the important distinction between somebody who has Force abilities and somebody who's a Jedi? I think now at this point in my fandom, it comes down to just a simple direct thing. It's it's you are choosing to take on the responsibilities of what this all means and what it's all about and and and, and the force itself. Uh, you are choosing to take on the responsibilities of representing uh, uh, the force, of, of, of standing with the light and, and trying to push it out into the galaxy and standing before the dark. It is it is a it is a responsibility to me. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not a burden, but it is a choice. When you take that choice, you continue to make those choices, and you stand with and for the force, I think. Yeah. Sounds like a recruiting plan, but... <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer? Um, I'm sorry. Were we talking about the, about the, the, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm having a brain. Distinctions. Yeah. yeah. The, the distinction <laughs> between just oh, being a Jedi. force user versus being a Jedi. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why I actually really liked the last Jedi, even though I knew that this was possible before, but seeing the stable hand at the end of the film to Mary Blagg, right. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. idea that he could be force sensitive, it just felt like a democratization of, of the force for mm -hmm. me, whether he's going to become a Jedi, we don't know if he's going to get that training and all that stuff, but it's just, I, and I forgot about catalyst with Jyn Erso's mom. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. Or even Maz Kanata, like you're saying, mm -hmm. I love that idea. It's like the sixth sense that we all kind of sometimes feel or this deja vu, right? It's not that we're all psychic. It's just mm -hmm. a feeling that we have. It feels very, mm -hmm. it feels very believable to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that makes a ton of sense. Um, I think for me, the, the distinction between having force abilities and being a Jedi it is that the, the Jedi, again, is the training, it's the commitment, it's making a vow, it's, you know, a, 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 it's a philosophy and a career, not yeah. a power set. Mm, um, right. it, it is like, hey, if you, you could, you know, be in, in a, a amazing uh, pianist, but the decision to become a concert pianist is a job, it's a vow. You know, it's a it's a I don't know if it's a philosophy, uh, but I think to me, it's important to make a distinction between a power set and the commitment. Uh, mm -hmm. Ahsoka and Sabine are in an era where they can define what it means to be a Jedi for themselves. Uh, but, you know, Ahsoka isn't training Sabine just to use powers. She is training her 
or to have powers, but she's training her to be a, a part of this legacy and this commitment and this philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which okay. we, we, we could uh, sometime do a full a whole episode about uh, uh, Yoda telling Luke in, in Return of the Jedi, the last of the Jedi you will be. But for me, that is when I was a kid, that was yeah, because he, his, of his He's abilities. A... Now, yeah. for me, it's his commitment. He's on the path. Mm -hmm. He's going to be a Jedi, a philosophy. Wow. Mm -hmm. I want to see yeah. an old old person become a, like discovering that they have this ability and being like, I'm going to train. I'm going to do this because uh, that would give me hope right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We knew uh, more more middle aged uh, first time Jedi. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Well, I was a scoundrel, but I make it well, I, I mean, that's kind of what uh, Sabine isn't middle aged. She's just hitting 30. Mm. Uh, but yeah. hey, when you, you hit 30, culture tells you you're you're already middle aged. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't agree with that, but, but she's kind of doing that. She's a career shift. I was a Mandalorian warrior, rebel, uh, mm -hmm. painter. <laughs> no, yeah. no, we got it. Uh, so we've, we've been talking about this a little bit. We're going to, uh, talk this and then we are going to take a quick break. Uh, there are often discussions about Star Wars balance between being a dynastic story and a democratic story. On one hand, you can hear people uh, say or write that, uh, this story, the Star Wars story has been about the Skywalkers basically a royal family with power in their blood. Uh, the the uh, different strong opinions about the sequel trilogy because Ray's story did become one of being connected to a bloodline, uh, connected to uh, Palpatine. And on the other hand, uh, you can have interpretations like this that's going on with Sabine, that the force is for everyone, anyone, anyone can be the heroes who make a difference. Does this story with Sabine for you, Ken, does it have an impact on the way you feel about the the Star Wars balance between being a, a dynastic story and a democratic story? I, I think it, it impacts in a way of like, yeah, we're getting to explore this. Hey, it's for everyone. You know, if you want to concentrate, commit and, and have the most serious mind, it's there. I think that's valuable. Uh, I, I also like the chosen one stories and I like, uh, you know, having to pull a sword from the stone and, and some, some big giant sweeping magical stuff that that's more classic fairy tale stuff. I, I think it's a good balance. So I think it's, it, it's helped. Um, it's helped me understand the value of the story a little bit more just based on how I grew up that it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's Luke and yeah, Kenobi and Yoda, but they're off the map and it's Luke, you know, and Leia too. Right. Yeah. That's, but yeah, I, I think it, I, I like where, points the, the 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 some of the stories for some folks if that makes sense yeah how about you jennifer i think if it had just stuck with one through six episode episodes one through six i think it would have been fine having it be this family right the, the mm -hmm. legacy of this family but if you want to have these stories continue you you can't just have like dueling force sensitive families it'd be like game of thrones right like you gotta have you gotta open it up a little bit and so like i said with the last jedi it really felt like it was letting and even the ray as a nobody it was making this statement right that that you do not have to come from this you know incredible family lineage you stable kid can have this force and if you really believe in yourself and you train hard you can you know achieve your dreams uh so i think that that's a really important message not just for for me as an adult but certainly for children who uh, feel like they're uh, up against a lot of odds. It's like, no, anybody can be a hero. Don't believe that you have to be a part of this family, a part of this legacy. Like you can help, you can help out your community and take action for in a positive way. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And I, I agree with that. I, I'm happy for the Sabine thing because I think it brings that democratic perspective that, that people did love about the last Jedi. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it, it brings brings that to the forefront in regards to the force. I get um, I get frustrated with the dynastic versus uh, democratic story because I understand where people are coming from. We've had a lot of talk about the Skywalker legacy and Anakin being a chosen one, and and I understand the. I think the Palpatine thing with Ray was far more about what is the worst thing that Ray has to face mm -hmm. um, in, in her past mm -hmm. than than any desire to make it more dynastic. I, I understand that there are absolutely readings of, of Star Wars uh, being dynastic, but to me, it has always been democratic. The intent has been democratic. It's part of the reason I wanted to start our conversation with, how did we feel about the original trilogy? We felt at, it was a story about a kid from nowhere who's actually, you know, ha has something valuable to offer. 
there's that perspective that it feels like just to me, the intent of Star Wars has always been to be very democratic. And then there is the um, great. Some some people are born with lots of natural talent and the spotlight gets put on them and the spotlight's been on the Skywalkers because of their natural talent. But the first film is predicated on the chosen one hero with the dynastic blood, Luke Skywalker, probably gets blown up by his dad unless the nobody scoundrel makes a better choice. And through his his cold heart where he thinks he's out for number one, instead decides, actually, we're all in this together and I got to be there for my friend. Han and Luke win together in A New Hope. Lando steps up in Empire Strikes Back. He, he, all the way through to Rise of Skywalker when you have the incredibly democratic lines of there's, there's more of us, Poe. There's Just more me. of us. I, I feel like it's always been both. But when we focus solely on the force part of the storytelling, there can be a, a focus on the, the royal blood and the dynastic. And I'm really glad that, that Sabine is helping expand that story. So hopefully people can see the parts of Star Wars that has always been Hmm. Very much the nature of the force. We're all connected. We're all in this together. We all have different things to add, but we all matter. We all have powers. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the 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 last Jedi to rise, you know, um, change. It was it was a bit of a change, a gear mm -hmm. shift. Uh, yeah, I, I think I've I, like Jen, your perspective on it uh, was echoed by some folks I worked with back in the day, and and I, I really um, I really understand that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I was pulled in by the, this girl from nowhere who literally climbs a mountain to find herself at the center of the story. And there's great value in that. There, I, um, I, I like where it went. I like where it moved. Probably in line with Joseph on that, but I, I, I get it too. I, I just always, I think the Sabine thing is 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 a good balance uh, for someone like me, an a hole like me, who's like, I love football. So, I, but I love the Miami Dolphins, fifty three highly trained, skilled players i don't want to go to the park and watch 22 dudes having a flag football game you know like when i'm sitting down for a movie but when you're talking about inspiration talk about what you can take for your life i think sabine represents a lot of even uh you know jen what you're saying here that it that there's great value in these modern times because it's not 1983 mm -hmm. to get that reminder that we're all here and you all can make yeah. that choice Mm -hmm. And we're going to dive into more of the power of uh, Sabine's story after we uh, take this uh, this quick break. But before we do that, we have a recommendation, right, Ken? We do. And I want to add this to the top of the story here, Joseph. Uh, maybe uh, this, this this Alex texted me this, and, and I think by the time this episode gets out, people will have known this information. I'm going to have an update because it leads into our recommendation here, all right? Okay. okay. Uh, this is from Brad uh, uh, Rao, uh, the supervising director, one of the executive producers of the series. He makes clear that – and this is from StarWars.com. He makes clear that her, Vet Ventress's return, will honor prior tales, including the book in which the character apparently perished. Quote, we don't want to spoil anything, but want fans to know that any new storytelling with Ventress will align with the events of Star Wars Dark Disciple. What is Star Wars Dark Disciple? A book you can try out on us <laughs> by going to audibletrial.com slash Force Center. Download your free audiobook today. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Force Center for your free audiobook. We'll take a quick break, deal with that news and that update, and come back for more here on Force Center. All right, welcome back. Uh, uh, Joseph, uh, Jen, any, any thoughts to the updated information? Thanks to Alex Damon for texting me that mid-recording. <laughs> Even when we try to be caught up with the news, <laughs> we're caught <laughs> flat-footed. Yeah. Um, there, mm -hmm. there, there's some delightful ambiguity about that because it doesn't mm -hmm. just straight up say, hey, don't worry. Uh, it's, it's a flashback. Yeah. It's this, right. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's true. But it's also, I, I, in some ways, like, you know what? Just much like Obi-Wan counsels Luke, patience. Patience. We'll, patience. We'll all see it, and then we'll have a full discussion of, of what happens. We don't need to center on our anxieties about what if they mm -hmm. handle it wrong. Um, mm -hmm. So for the Ahsoka, or the uh, Asajj part of it, I'm just I'm excited to see the character. I'm excited to see it back. Mm -hmm. I'm almost more intrigued by the business side of it that, mm -hmm. like, yeah, th this, is, this is a part of courting an intense fanship who mm -hmm. falls in love with uh, Asajj in my heart is not a small character, but no. in the grand scope of Star Wars, she's a, she's a smaller character who hasn't mm -hmm. as much exposure. And there are those of us who love her and have tattoos of her. And to just throw her in there without 
it's fascinating that you can't put out a trailer without needing to put out a press release. <laughs> a press re- that's about incredible. Stuff. Yeah, that, in some ways, that's the like times change, and here's where we are. Yeah, uh, yeah. fascinating I- to me. I think it's intentional, though, because if he says it's a flashback, which it very well may be, then everyone's like, oh, and they may not want to tune in. Right. They yeah, may be like, yeah. oh, but if he's like, it may be, I cannot confirm or deny. I was like, yay, I'm going to watch and we're going to hope that, you know, something new is happening. And then it's a flashback. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I do think it's interesting that they put out this statement that they felt the. I don't know if it's a need. No. I don't know. I, I think they get it. You know, they're yeah. fans themselves and they know how yeah. we all feel about it. So yeah, yeah very smart. It. Very they smart. Get it. They get you, it. You want to lead the conversation. You're trying to get fans excited. Why would you want them to obsess about something that you don't intend? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. There you go. Yeah, I, I think it, it speaks to a bigger biggest business thing that we've talked about before. Um, uh, I, I, I actually recently ran into someone uh, in, inside the Lucasfilm sphere. We had this discussion in a wood ranch in Burbank. Of us, <laughs> I, I, I wish they'd sometimes get ahead of the narrative as best they can. You can't mm-hmm. – it's impossible to right. control it. It's going to do what it's going to do. But this is an acknowledgement of, yeah, 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 we, we know what we did and – we got there's some reasons for it. Just hold on. Yeah. You you say patience, Luke. Uh, Joseph, mm-hmm. I always go to, to Jar Jar. Steady, steady. Like, <laughs> yes, uh, you can uh, throw those energy balls later, and we will <laughs> have great fun with that. Uh, should we get back to Sabine? Indeed, indeed. Excellent. So, I want to talk specifically about Sabine's journey and everyone having the force. Uh, we did touch on her force journey in in our live action Rebels episode, and I think we have a a mix of opinions uh, amidst ourselves and maybe even in our own individual souls. Uh, Ken, for you, what was valuable or interesting about seeing the journey of a you know in quotes less talented, less naturally talented student of mm. the force? I apologize. I don't remember all the things I said on that episode. So if I repeat things, uh, I, I really truly apologize. Not just to your uncle at a party, uh, who might still be drunk from the weekend. But I, uh, I, I, I really like it. But I, I do remember saying, and I still understand. Uh, my, I, understand I understand myself when I say I didn't under, understand why Sabine and why now. But that's mm. not entirely negative. That just means I'm excited to find out because I am excited that Floney. Because, of course, Dave Wood puts on that cowboy hat and says, the man in flannel and I probably discussed this in break rooms. We we discussed this in writing sessions. We This goes back to Empire. goes back to all the things we we're talking about. Uh, it goes back to Jan Dodana believing in the Force. We're going to explore that side of it. Uh, and, and, and we're going to see where it goes. Because I don't know... You know, it's it's really wide open with Sabine, how far she mm-hmm. takes this. Uh, and I think my reaction of I didn't understand why Sabine and why now was because I love so much of what was already in her story. So I was ready to pick up that. The Mand- Mandalorian warrior and the trials of the dark saber. And it was like, oh, oh, we're going different. And that can sometimes challenge. That can, that can sometimes push you off. We just talked about the episode eight, episode nine switch. Uh, and I think that's now I'm at this. All right. I'm game to find out what this really means. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I love what you're saying. And I love that's such a great way to center it because we we're talking about it in the context of this is uh, Sabine's story where Sabine is is the representative of the idea. Mm-hmm. Everyone has the force. But mm-hmm. what you reacted to is it wasn't about Sabine shouldn't have the force. It was about her is a character of why is this her journey now? Yeah. Not she shouldn't have the force, but yes. more about yeah. who, who is she as a character? Is this what she would want, wanting to understand why she wants it? All those things that are character based, right? Yeah, I didn't yell, uh, Star Wars is not for women and I don't want more girl <laughs> Jedis. I didn't yell that. I didn't yell that I don't want this. I just was like, so moved by this character. You know, she was one of the, you know, she's so many favorites for people. She's mm-hmm. she's a favorite coming out of Rebels. And I was there too. That the Trials of the Dark Saber stuff is some heavy, heavy storytelling. Um, but, if you, yeah. but if you go back to that, it, it makes sense. It's a saber. It's a saber you got to connect with to use. She gets those lessons from Kanan. I'm not saying Filoni was putting the seeds there, but maybe he saw an opportunity. I, I don't know. He, he also has a pretty good handle on what he wants to do even years out. So, yeah, I, I, but going back to that, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah. Jen, what for you is is valuable about her her story? Because I think you're in a, you were in a similar place with Ken, right, where you were sort yes. of just bumped out of it because you didn't feel like that was the trajectory the character was on. I just feel, didn't feel like it was needed. And like you can, I was like, why now? 
she was already yep. like we, we were on a specific path with her and now we're on a new path where in some ways she, like i would expect for her to be able to like hold her own and join this fight with ahsoka and instead now it's almost like come on kid i'm gonna have to train you and she's more almost like a liability which is something that i was not anticipating and i obviously have a hard time with change i'm working through it um <laughs> but what i did like was seeing her self-doubt and it's very relatable, like when yeah. you're trying to get back into working out, right? It's really hard. Your muscles are not strong. You're not quick mm -hmm. like you might have been mm -hmm. in the past. And so seeing her really try to find herself. And I, I do hope that they do explain why now. I, I, I think, I don't know. I just think it's kind of an important thing. And well, maybe it will be revealed. We're missing those conversations intentionally, right? We're missing yeah. the recruitment from Ahsoka. Hey, have you ever thought of right. that? Yeah, we're missing mm -hmm. that. And, and that's, for, that's re it. for a reason. Yeah, yeah right. That's right. There it is. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. No, I, 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 I love what you're both saying. I think when the, the trailers dropped with the uh, revelation of Sabine calling Ahsoka master, and, mm. you know, it was during the strikes and you, the three of us would have done an eight hour episode on on that beat. Um, and we would have uh, been making predictions and we would have been texted halfway through by Alex Damon telling us about the press release. <laughs> <laughs> Alex. Um, when that trailer dropped, I thought, ooh, this might be an interesting story of being a Jedi is not just force abilities. It's a commitment, a vow, a philosophy. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't that mm -hmm. be interesting if Sabine was, if Ahsoka was like, Sabine, you have this desire to answer the ambiguous call that your your spiritual brother Ezra left you with of you're going to finish this journey. You mm -hmm. picked up that dark saber and you fought with it. You picked up his his blade. He left his blade with you. Finish his journey. And it doesn't matter if you can connect with the force. I'm going to train you in the philosophy and you're mm -hmm. going to make the commitment. I thought, oh, this might be a really interesting story of can you be a Jedi with no force powers? Um, right. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then it, mm -hmm. it became mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. can you just, if, if, mm -hmm. if Lando was like, you know what, actually I want to become a Jedi and I'm going to go through all the, it's, you know, it's not about the powers. It's about the, the commitment, the philosophy. Um, I thought mm -hmm. it might be that. Mm -hmm. So then when the story became like, no, she can not access the force. It's just, just not as naturally gifted. Um, I, I thought it still tapped into that, idea of it is about the philosophy as much as it is about the abilities you need the abilities and i agree i would love to see the story where did hera sent something did uh did sabine tell go, go after ahsoka and say you know i've been watching this video of ezra i want to follow in his footsteps i did feel something with kanan mm -hmm, i did mm -hmm. feel something more just that i can't put to words when i was playing the dark saber and ahsoka's like all right we'll we'll see what's there um mm -hmm. But from from Hu Yang's perspective, I I feel like Hu Yang gave her the old blood test at some point. I think the Shik razor came out at some point, and <laughs> what, Hu Yang's what? got like, I think Hu Yang's got the midi chlorian count right. So once it becomes the story that it is, and and mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. getting into the philosophy that we try to have on on Force Center often of embrace the story you're presented with. Once it once it is this story of yeah yeah she has the Force, but she's not as naturally talented. I think that becomes this great underdog story, mm -hmm. and that's what's relatable about it. Like, mm -hmm. a, uh, uh, Luke, Anakin, Ray, are all coded as nobody's from nowhere. Desert rats who are not important to the story. Mm -hmm. That's the way mm -hmm. other people react to them. We, we very quickly just move past that part of the story because we now know it is a dynastic story. It's a story of your powerful bloodline. But a lot of the power of their story was that the rest of the galaxy thinks you're not important, thinks you can't possibly do this. Can, can you work hard and, and surprise them, surprise yourself? And Sabine is almost like a resetting of that to mm -hmm. be like, she mm -hmm. she really is going to have to work harder. Mm -hmm. uh, she It is a real underdog story. When, I'm, when I think about Sabine's story, it reminds me of my wife trying to get me to do yoga. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm at first <laughs> just like... Uh, my wife is a trained dancer with natural <laughs> flexibility. She's like a Jedi, naturally flexible and has trained her entire damn life. And she's like, can't you just do this? And then like bends over and stands on her head and like, no, every bone in my body will snap. Tendons mm -hmm. will be flying like loose spaghetti. My body can't do that. I can't yeah. do that. And she's always like, no, you're not going to be able to do it 
as well as me because of yeah yeah mm-hmm. the, the, the way your body is made and the years you spent crunched over screens <laughs> but if you worked at it you you you're much more flexible than you think you are mm-hmm. 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 there there's great value in it you you can do yoga everybody can do yoga and i'm like ah i can't do yoga yeah. it, t- to me it's relatable and powerful in that way of like we might not be the best but that doesn't mean we don't have talent yeah I like that story though. Like yours, and like you were presenting with Sabine and Ahsoka, like what we didn't see. That's what I would have wanted to see. I, I just think <laughs> it, it kind of came in in a funny place. I either would want it to be like, hey, you know, like this awareness of it and and her approaching her, Ahsoka approaching Sabine, or she's already kind of got it, and but she still is struggling a little bit. I don't know. I just mm-hmm. felt like. I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It came in a kind of a funky spot in this story for me, at least. Yeah, no. I mean, I think like emotionally, the watching the video of Ezra to me isn't just about missing Ezra. It's about he asked me to continue this journey, and I really took that to heart. And I found this connection to the idea of being a Jedi, uh, the idea of being selfless, and mm-hmm. I want to follow that path. So the sort of emotional trajectory I can really in- infer. But then I do, like you both, get a little caught up in the like, but there's a really interesting story there when it comes to like sort of the abilities and Mm -hmm. why she followed that part of the path and whose idea was it? Did she, uh, and we talked about this before, was this Ahsoka or or Hera who came to her and said, actually, I think you can do this? Or Mm -hmm. was it her saying, I believe in myself? I really look forward to hearing that, that part of the story eventually. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, right. Like we, when you trace it and you, and, and you do what Force Center teaches you to do, right? Dig in, dig in and, and ask the why. And I, I, I'm totally fine with that. I, I can't escape that at times early on, trailer onward. It, it felt out of left field. I don't think that's correct. I think, again, going back to Charles Dark, I think it's all there. But I, I can't escape that at times it, it came out of left field for me, which is OK. Yeah. It just that was my starting point. I would have preferred for myself understanding so much of the story, the importance of the story was uh, Ahsoka and Sabine tried and they gave up. They both gave up. Yeah. But I still would have hooked into the story even more emotionally if I knew who started this idea, who yes. thought it could work. Is is an important thing for me to just feel even closer to the characters. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. And I know I know uh, other people feel very different, uh, very strongly in oh. different directions, and that is uh, respected. Uh, we are going to move on to the, the force use that, that Sabine did have in the show. Uh, she, we, we saw her struggling with the, uh, the force abilities. We saw her, her doubting uh, herself. Uh, but Jennifer, ultimately, how did you feel about her big moments of force use, uh, uh, calling the lightsaber to her hand to defeat that uh, Death Knight trooper uh, and the big push of uh, Ezra to his freedom, even sensing a fate something when Anakin uh, was appearing to Ahsoka in, in the final moments of the series. How did you feel about those moments of force use? I thought it was really important that, you know, it, when these moments where people that she cares about, right, or she's in the midst of this battle that she, she can call upon it. It's like that, you know, when you've heard about people who are able to do super, super strength things because Mm. in this moment they needed to save their child or to help a stranger, right? It that to me makes a lot of sense. Uh, because otherwise, I'm like, well, just a couple scenes ago, she's having a really hard time, and Hu Yang is talking all the smack about her, right? So it's like, (laughs) okay, now (laughs) that makes sense. So that that part of the story, I really I liked, I thought it was Mm. very, very well done. Yeah, Mm. Ken. Mm. Yeah, I, I like that take on it, Jen. I like looking at it that way of, of this, uh, you know, uh, when – not push, but when when you just have to react, when you just have to do it, right? Do or do not. Uh, it is – in uh, you know, all those kind of things. You know, she lifts the car. I, I, I'm, right. I'm with you on that. Uh, there was some – I like the moments where <laughs> she's – Kick an ass, and Hank's like, "Nah, here's your percentage point. It's not very good on these strikes." Um, <laughs> I like that kind of stuff because I think I respect what he represents too. Of look, look, this this failed for this Jedi Order failed for a lot 
lot more reasons than just uh, we really wanted you to know your forms, right? Like mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. It, it, the hubris was the re- not not the training, you know. Like there's bigger philosophy questions to have about why the Jedi Order fell. So some of this stuff still works. It, it worked for a reason. But hey, you know, we've always done it this way. Is not something you're supposed to you know think in business. I remember my old boss <laughs> told me that all the time when he came in to try to change things I'd done for 15 years. I get it. Um, so I get. In terms of my reaction to the um, to the force, my, my favorite one was actually the very end it was represented the journey for me and it helped me get to a a, a solid spot with her journey of feeling of being open to it it is a little like that finn i I, a feeling uh, talking to Janet Mm -hmm. about it Uh, i i really do like that along the way uh, i don't want to get into the negative weeds i i i don't i want to make i don't ever need shows to surprise me with every scene and every second i don't need to go whoa what a twist Uh, i when she does the force push on on ezra it was a little plotting for me where I was like, well, she's, she's going to succeed. Right. <laughs> like I just, and that's just my mileage with it, but I don't want to take away from the power of it. Cause I think it is tied to what, what you're talking about, Jen. It, 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 I don't need unpredictability in my stories. I need to sometimes celebrate the character in that moment. Sabine doesn't know that it's going to succeed. Ezra doesn't <laughs> know. I might know as a Disney plus subscriber, it's going to succeed, <laughs> but the characters don't. And I think that's the value. And that's where I try to engage on it. But therefore the one at the end is just, it's just wonderful. It's very warm. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 uh, I don't, it's, it's my favorite one. I'll in, I'll in there. <laughs> some, some starlights in the shadows, I believe. I, I, yeah. I, I, might, I might be uh, getting that wrong, but some starlights in the shadows is a nice poetic, uh, dare I say pulpy line. And also just like that, yeah. that feels like where she's at. It's like, I feel it. I feel it, but I, I'm, I'm working to keep uh, connecting to it. Uh, I understand what you're saying about her force use at the end. I think there's the, there's that power of storytelling sometimes where certain stories, get a power from surprising you. And uh, there's a great Kurt Vonnegut uh, quote, uh, the novelist Kurt Vonnegut about, you know, you should write a story where if you die, anybody could finish the last 10 pages where, mm-hmm. where that a power of narrative is like, mm-hmm. like music, even, even those, us, those of us like me who are entirely tone deaf, you can hear the note resolve and come home in that yeah, when yeah. you can hear it getting closer to coming home, wanting it to resolve and come home. And I think some of her force use, it has that joy of, yeah, if you paused it and said, "Hey, everybody, let's take bets," is she gonna yeah. drop Ezra? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you would yeah, be like, yeah, yeah. "No, yeah. Uh, we know that." But the emotional desire is in. Yep. I feel the music building. This is the beautiful moment. I I desire that resolution. Thank you for delivering what I'm desiring. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that is definitely there for me in, in both of her her moments of uh, big force use, calling the lightsaber and and mm-hmm. saving Ezra. Mm-hmm. What I liked about it is um, there's I mentioned this before. There's that moment where um, Ahsoka tells uh, Hu Yang, I'm not trying to get her to be a Jedi. I'm trying to get her to be herself. Like Ahsoka has kind of figured out, like, I need I need to teach you all the traditional Jedi stuff because the the old ways have power and you need to know those, too. But the way you access the force is uh, through your perspective and your reality and your needs. And I love that. I would love it if it was a story point where Sabine can never move a cup in a training exercise. Hmm. But if she is in the heat of the battle in the moment when she needs something as somebody who is full of energy, propulsive, dynamic, hmm. that's her world, that's her life. It, uh, it it makes sense to her in the moment. Like I can use the force at a run, <laughs> but hmm. I can't just stop and use it cold. That to mm. me is interesting because it's it's uh, it's using the force uh, um, in a way that tells us more about the character and and who she is, and mm. not just a sort of force limit of like Ahsoka can move that rock, but it's too big for Sabine. Yeah, if it's more like yeah. Sabine can use the force in ways that make sense to her in moments that make sense to her when she can tap into it that way, and I feel like that's what I liked about the story of it was a a moment of danger. I yeah. really loved the pushing Ezra because it was the conviction in herself of I took this risk to come here Mm -hmm. because I was committed that this is what needs to happen. It it is her literally, you know, believing in her mission by pushing Ezra in that moment. Uh, I like the lightsaber thing because it was, she's a character of action and it's an action moment. Um, Yeah. 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 I, yeah. Not to get to the negative weeds. It, it, it it would have been one an incredibly cool moment if it wasn't so similar to the lightsaber beat in Last Jedi with the mm-hmm. yeah 
yeah. the, but that is a minor quibble. I'm uh, just uh, trying to be a little bit more honest about some of my minor quibbles <laughs> yeah, yeah. because they do exist. Um, yeah. But I love the, the character perspective and I really am excited to see that, um, that grow um, in that, in that same final episode, Ahsoka tells, um, tells Sabine that being a Jedi isn't about wielding a lightsaber, um, which has some really interesting thing rhythms within the first big force uses are calling the lightsaber. So I hope that it, those ideas are expl explored more of like, um, mm -hmm. is this, is Ahsoka wrong? Like for somebody like Sabine, <laughs> wielding a weapon is how she connects to the force because she's a warrior. Right. Um, all right, mm -hmm. uh, moving on. Uh, Ken, I was just joking about sort of limits on Sabine's power. Would you like in, in the second season to see her have limits to her, her power, to see things that she's like, I can't do that, or I at least can't do that in the traditional way. Is that interesting storytelling to you, or does that get into too much power ranking? It, it might get into the rankings, but it'd be hilarious <laughs> if there's some things that happen, or if there's just things she's trying to lift an X-Wing. She's like, oh, I can't do that. And everyone's like, yeah, you're right. You can't do that. Uh, but I, <laughs> I, I think it would go against the spirit of even the stuff we're discussing here today. But uh, I would love to see her run up against those limits and find ways to push past it or find I, – I like what you're saying about force powers or abilities or moves or moments that make sense for her, that make sense for her in that moment. Uh um, yeah, maybe she can't hit a, a 50 foot, uh, jump shot with, with her, uh, you know, blindfold on her, but, but she can, she can give that try. Uh, I, I'd love exploring that there. Uh, also the, you know, a little humor every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> Would, wouldn't work. W would, mm -hmm. would work. No, yeah. I mean, I think it's natural to a little bit of an underdog story of like, mm, you, you do have one hand tied behind your back. Uh, now you're figuring out how to do this in a different way. Uh, Jennifer, how do you feel about, uh, seeing the limits on Sabine's power? I think it's important. I do not want her to become a Jedi master. I don't want her to be like quieting her mind and, you know, shh, shh, shh. I don't want to see that. I feel like it goes mm -hmm. against the character. We saw her being kind of scrappy, resourceful. I feel like this should just be another tool mm -hmm. in that she can use, right? She needs like to use something from, from her armor, like a whatever, mm -hmm. like a grappling thing, right? Like do what you got to do. Is it a lightsaber? Okay. Use a lightsaber. Is it a force push? Great. Might be something else. I just feel like that to me makes more sense with the character and it just doesn't feel like so much like here's a new Jedi that we've introduced. I don't want to see mm. it. Hmm. I like yeah. I, I, I don't mind the character evolving and being able to add a little bit more like a uh, calm and reflection to her skill set, mm. but I don't want to lose the connection to there there's nothing wrong with who I have been. I am right. scrappy. I, I tag things. I'll get a little bit calmer in my old age. And, you know, maybe I'm not, you know, angry tagging things. Maybe I'm peacefully making, you know, this, you know, uh, beautiful sculpture out of, out of sand using the force, but that there's, I, I don't want to lose who the character was. I'm open to seeing her evolve, but I really don't want to lose who the character was. And I think that scrappiness, that defiance, the, a, I'm a warrior. It's a legitimate part of my culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to see her powers not limited, but expressed differently. Of like, I can't do it that way. I, I, I can't just reach out and throw that huge boulder out of the way. I can, um, you know, agitate a, a combustible rock underneath it and blow it up because that mm -hmm. makes sense to me and makes sense to who I am. Uh, I would love to see character based using the force differently the way they've been doing such a good job in the high Republic of different people have different strengths. And I would love to see what, if she is a warrior, what is her, what is the way she expresses that through the force? Mm -hmm. It's a big question. Yeah. It's a big question. Yeah. Uh, so any other thoughts on Sabine before we uh, start to wrap up by talking about some other characters in star Wars? No, I just was, I, I I'm on this journey. There's been some missteps for me just as a, fan engaging with it um but i really love this character right and if this is where she's going i want to follow that yeah mm, yeah Jen, any I, final sabine thoughts 
I need to see her struggle. I think of that scene with the Death Troopers that I know a lot of people picked out. I'm not going to get in the negative weeds here, but with, you know, Soka, Ezra, and Sabine fighting them. And it just, it didn't, there didn't just felt kind of like, chin, 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 chin. like there was no, I don't know, it didn't feel like much of a struggle. Um, but so I want to see Sabine struggle. I mm. want to see her being like, I don't know what to, oh, that's right. I can do this, right? Mm -hmm. Having moments like that to me, it gives it gives it just some more color and life and relatability. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Sabine was one of my very favorite parts of Ahsoka. I, I really like the actor. I really like the the that we got to kind of grow up with this um, rebellious teen. <laughs> I love that we meet her as a as a depressed third year old living alone with her cat, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. and she goes on this journey. There's this great underdog story, and, and I don't. I'm so fascinated to see her journey with the Force, wrestling with. I, I need to find the way it makes sense to me. It's, I'm I'm very different. I come from a long line of unconventional Jedi, and I need to lean into being unconventional. And you know, how does that journey work for her? How does that journey work for for her master, who's committed to being there for her? But you know, I think there could be a lot of great comedy of Ahsoka being like, "Right, you're not going to do it the way I'm asking you to. You're going to have to find your own way." Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping for that. Looking forward to that possibility. Uh, so to, to round out our conversation about the force being for everyone, uh, Ken, how do you feel about the idea that characters might be accessing the force in different ways without even knowing it, that what we have observed in star Wars as a uh, luck, intuition, natural skill might actually be the way that somebody taps into the force is Han's luck. Han tapping into the force is Lando's charm. Like <laughs> that's his force ability. Uh, Hera's piloting, you know, are, are these expressions of the force? Is that what Kara was talking about? He's got a big connection to the force. Uh, he's great. <laughs> um, sorry. I went there. Um, his prodigious connection. to the force. <laughs> I, I really like it in theory. Cause I do think it connects to some of the stuff I love around the, the uh, Finn character. I know it's not widely uh, loved or some people just want it maybe even explore more as I hope maybe one day we get that chance. His uh, it's a feeling connects seven, eight, nine to me. Like it makes sense. It makes sense in terms of just, this is what the force represents this thing that is about light and dark and empathy and trying not to push one side, uh, the darkness over the light. Like all it makes a lot of sense, but I also don't want to get so into the weeds of it where, uh, I don't think it would. I don't your question doesn't isn't that, but like where it would be explained to Han. Well, really, you just you were tapping to the force. Mm -hmm. Um, but it makes sense. It makes sense for this story. Uh, it makes sense for Star Wars, the galaxy of Star Wars, that this thing exists and you're all connected to it. Sometimes whether you know it or not, I think that's pretty powerful. I think that's pretty interesting, even if I don't need it explained beat for beat. You know, even if I, you know, Chief Chirpa felt it like, <laughs> nah, you know, yeah. but but it, it, in terms of a philosophy and going back to even what the first three were about, this this fairy tale uh, yeah. to, to tell you, here's what's out there for you to connect into. I like that. Yeah. Mm. Jennifer, how do you feel about that? I like that a lot. And I, I like the idea of it being like this six sense, like I said, type of thing. The thing yeah. where I do get a little torn is where it, if everything is explained by the force, then it feels almost very religious, right? <laughs> like it's like, yeah, yeah, oh, that, yeah, that yeah, yeah. That's what I'm trying to, yeah, that's, yeah I'm right? dancing around it maybe, but yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. That's yeah. where I'm like, uh, uh, I don't know if I feel comfortable with that, but, uh, but I do kind of like maybe this like little uh, force theme in the background occasionally that we, that we sometimes hear, could it be? Maybe not. Like, it's just the mystery of it. I'm okay with. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, it it is about, this is why, from my fandom of Star Wars, the sort of the the, the Force as um, the connection to, to more than the sum of our parts and, and listening to our intuition and tapping into our natural talent and, and believing in ourselves, like, all that uh really guides me because yeah i don't i don't ever want anyone to have given han solo a midi chlorine test i han's never going to have tapped right, right, into right, the right, force right. because he'd just be like ah uh, no um i don't think he's great at piloting the falcon because like qui-gon says about anakin he sees things before them happens as a jedi trait i don't i don't mm -hmm. think that's what han's doing right but right right but han's intuitive he trusts himself he trusts his instincts and i kind of like the idea of like the force is it, it, it helps it helps you be you. It helps you be your best you. <laughs> yeah, you know, and yeah. it doesn't have to be about a, a talent measurement that uh I remember as a kid, I haven't didn't get a chance to look it up. I think it's in the Return of the Jedi picture storybook where 
Han has fallen off the skiff and his his feet uh, hit hit the skiff and he he holds and there's something like the old solo luck uh, was still there and I remember as a kid being like is Han's luck like the Force does he have like does he tap into a <laughs> luck field <laughs> that um, I, next you know I, I'm yeah. trying to look up I have a copy you guys are of that both well, I have out. a pop up look which <laughs> oh, is not yeah. the same <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, the I pop-up mean, book is beautiful, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's. Uh, we'll do some follow-up. Yeah. Research. We'll do some follow-up. But <laughs> just, just, just <laughs> popping up the pop-up. That's great. Um, yeah. So for I, I know some fans are probably li listening or watching, screaming, "No!" Oh, sorry. <laughs> the, no, not the pop-up. To the idea oh. that Han could be tapping into the force. Mm -hmm. I don't mean it is an Anakin thing. I just mean it is. I'm, I'm the the force yeah. is large and mysterious, and I'm open to just considering it as talent. That yeah. Dex's food is good as an expression of the oh, force. Yes, yeah, talent is the force. Absolutely. Uh, and along those lines, uh, Ken, what other characters might have success if they tried to use the force? Uh, I mean, Dex is a great answer. Have you ever had food here in in the real world where it makes you believe in God because of what they put <laughs> together? Like, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I was tr I was going to try to have a you know a little more jokey answer. I can't. Uh, Padme, mm. Padme, she might have saved it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> might have mm. said. In fact, I'm almost upset at the midi chlorians that they didn't jump from Anakin and go to Padme. Like, oh, this one, she might actually. <laughs> all right, this is better. Uh, yeah. Padme, she represents, she's steadfast. We've talked about this all the time. That's who she is. She represents the best of this world. Yeah. Yeah. Dex is my answer. I think, I think he could, he could tap into the, the force yeah. if it was uh, food centric. Uh, Jennifer, do you have a serious or a jokey answer to what characters would have success if they tried to use the force? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm still upset about the Finn thing. I, I just mm. really, I really was, I was so excited. I love Ray. But I was so excited. I'm like, it's going to happen. Okay. It didn't happen. And, and I don't know what that is. I don't know why I felt that way. Uh, and obviously, timeline-wise, it would not work for him to be training under Ahsoka. But I just feel like mm. the, 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 I just really want to see that. The way that his character was set up, the whole arc of it in, in Force Awakens, it just felt right. And I'm still holding out hope that it could happen. Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. But I just... That to me would have been a really, really great story to tell. I, I really do hope that his good. his story can get fleshed out because I I love what is what is there, and I, I understand it's a huge conversation about the way they put him across in the press, and and he showed him with the lightsaber for Force Awakens, you yeah. know, in at least partially to disguise the the Ray reveal and all that. Um, I love what I love about Rise of Skywalker is that he seems so content in accessing the force in a different way in a unique way that it for him it is it is into, it's intuitive it's a feeling um and he, he in the bonding over the the whole company uh that deserted that because they felt they felt they had no um exposure to to information that what the first story was doing wrong and they just sensed it uh yeah, yeah. so uh this whole idea of the force being something for everyone something uh intuitive i think finn is a great representation of that and i would love to explore that story more and i think it could have some of the weight in the power that sabine's story might if, if it was given more room right i mean yeah. it just feels yeah. like return of the jedi all over again where i was like yes leia's leia's got it never see her train <laughs> later right and yeah. it's like yes finn's got okay we're not going to see him train i'm just like all right all right <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're not alone. You're not alone. So you want to see Finn train. You want to see him unlock his. I, yeah. You gave me Sabine. Sabine is amazing. I love Sabine. I needed Finn. Th this is what I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> this is not what I ordered. And Sorry. more, they, you know, you know, and this is this is not count, but they got a little blip of it in the Lego special, right? Where, where right. He, yep. yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's uh, again, that's oh not a gosh, replacement right. for what's what what could have been, but uh, <laughs> it does. Uh, it's there and it's present. I, I hope we look. I hope we get it. I I, I hope uh, you know. We'll see what happens in the future. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's so freaking good. He's so talented. He really is. I, I really hope for for more Finn storytelling. Here's the final question on our discussion of uh, everyone having the Force. Uh, what characters, because of who they are as a character, would fail horribly if they tried to use the Force? Ken, do you have thoughts? 
Two answers. Beaumont Kin would just not understand <laughs> the magic side of it. He'd look at just the stats, the Google sheet of it. He, he couldn't. And then the one who I think could get dangerously close and then completely misuse it is Saw Gerrera. Oh, he could oh, have in the dark side. Wow. Yeah, yeah sure. he'd, ta- he'd be like, Good. that necessary rage. Yep. Colin Trevorrow was right, he'd say. Uh, it's necessary <laughs> rage. And he'd tap into the dark side because I always, I already, I, I, I think Luthen Rails already, he's off the rails at times with his philosophies. Uh, uh, even though it comes from a real good place with uh, uh, good intentions, I think uh, Saw would be in that as well. Yeah, love it. That's a good love answer. it. Um, for myself, I picked uh, two characters because uh, to, to me, it is a, it, it, if everyone has it up to a point, and it is about your willingness to train to try to open yourself to it. For me, this becomes great, like a, a great exploration of who's <laughs> really uptight. Or really, really has a different focus uh, than the Force. Sagar is a great example because it is uh, tapping into it in a different way by focusing your intensity and your rage. Who know, maybe Hux would have been great. Uh, mm. <laughs> a, a lot of anger, <laughs> uh, but um, I, Watto, I think. Oh wow, Watto, Watto wow. would join the Jedi Order and then like try to pay a kid to be like, eh, do it for me," <laughs> because money, 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 money. money. The other person who cracks me up, imagine them like actually giving themselves a, a physical hernia trying to use the force is a uh, Cyril Karn from Ant. Oh my god! <laughs> He's so tight. He's so angry. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Love to see that. Yeah. yeah. yeah he just, uh, Soul yeah. would break. Yeah. His fingers snap. Uh, it's straining. Uh, Jennifer, who for you would fail horribly? <laughs> if they tried just to use imagine, the force. M- Mama Karn. You don't. You don't have this. Why are you trying? <laughs> Get an yeah, office job. Jedi. You guys got good. One. I have nothing because I honestly like so many of the Star Wars characters are so driven by their egos mm. that that right there mm-hmm. eliminates most right. of them, right? Because you got to let that ego go. I mean, so uh, there's so there's very few characters that I would believe in. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah. The rest of them, I'm like, yeah, they'd be they'd be toast. Yeah. Yeah. How would you feel if we discovered that Chewie could use the force the whole time and he's just like, ah, I didn't want to. I got I got enough skills. I don't need to be doing that. <laughs> it, could, it could work. I, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so yeah, yeah. I mean make, that yeah. would be pretty amazing if like if uh you know if if Chewie's kind of like old and retired by the time the Ray Jedi Order movie, but he's just like lifting a rock just a little bit. He's like, oh, she taught me after all these years. <laughs> oh, that's fun! I like yeah. that. Yeah, that's good. Chewy, okay. Old, old, great Chewy reaches out and the the tree shakes a little bit, and an animal falls out. He can eat. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Black. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, all right, that is our big look uh, at uh, when everyone has the force. It's an exciting time. Uh, like we said at the top, this is something that's always been discussed by by Lucas by Filoni. Uh, now it is in our storytelling, and I think it means that we have a lot more uh, storytelling and philosophizing as fans. Uh, Ken, we have an ask. You want to look at our ask? <laughs> I do. I do. Our ask Sorry. is, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, to go to our Patreon page and consider supporting. Uh, we have a goal out there right now. If we get to 400 paid subscribers, any level, uh, we are currently at 385 at the time of this recording. Uh, we will do a commentary of a Star Wars film. Uh, we're going to kind of pick up and maybe uh, restart or continue that series. Uh, it'll uh, be a lot of fun. We'll make them available to the public, but exclusive to uh, for, for purchase and exclusive to the Patreon supporters. And you get to help us choose. We at 400, we'll put out a poll and you tell us what movie to do. You get to be the uh, Hu Yang in the situation said, no, <laughs> that. Do that. Uh, I, I really like you. I, I'm sounding like I'm against them. I'm not. Uh, you can uh, consider and take that all in by going to patreon.com slash force center. That is great. And I failed to update our notes. Uh, we are actually at uh, 389 paid subscribers oh, right wow. now. So very close, so close to the 400 paid. So I didn't want Alex to have to text us to let us know how many paid subscribers <laughs> we have. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I would throw it out here. Uh, we'll also do a quick reminder that we got those live streams coming up uh, yeah. on Tuesday, uh, January 23rd, 1130 a.m. We're going to do a Bad Batch Season 3 trailer live stream and our big monthly Four Center live stream Friday, January 26th, 2 p.m. Pacific. Ken, where else can people find us? Hey, you can find us on Twitter and threads at Four Center Pod. We are on Instagram. Our Facebook page is Facebook. 
Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. We are available in a lot of spots as a podcast. Just search. You will uh, find us there. Merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. And as I said, you can go to patreon.com slash Force Center to support us directly. Uh, I am at Ken Napsuck and KenNapsuck.com. I, I changed my camera angle a little bit. I, I, this is how selfish I am. I did this because I've been wearing Brian Ward shirts on our video side. I wanted people to see Brian Ward's shirts and go to his T Public page and, and get a shirt. And then I wore my band shirt today. So support the Moon Age shirts. Uh, go to the Moon Bandcamp.com for more. Jen, where can they find you? You can find me on uh, where YouTube. Okay, first of all, thank you all for bearing with me today. I had a really hard, we partied hard, the parents uh, and our wow. kids this past weekend. So I'm like, woof, I need more coffee. You can find me on YouTube and Instagram. <laughs> at Jennifer Landa, TikTok at Jennifer Landa 1138. I've been doing more Star Wars videos, little tidbits, uh, Star Wars yeah. word nerd uh, things. Mm. I'll be getting back into some 80s and 90s videos soon. I love that. I don't ever want that to go away, Jen. So please uh, take some mama's little helpers, get through the day. <laughs> and make more of us. Uh, Joseph, take us home. You've uh, successfully launched your newsletter. It's going good. Where, where can they find it? Yeah, I'm really excited about the newsletter. It's uh, called Finish Your Monsters. It is a, uh, a phrase that I used to say to myself uh, when I was trying to finish a first draft to just convince myself to complete a thing. So this is a weekly uh, blog, newsletter, whatever the correct noun is, uh, discussing my uh, creative adventures and uh, trying to inspire other people to finish the projects they're working on. I've been setting weekly goals, and so far it's been really great to have that. I said that out loud to the internet and everybody that I'm going to do that this week and helping me uh, stay focused. So if you're interested in that, if you want some help trying to stay focused, you can check it out uh, by going to buttondown.email slash finish your monsters, or you can just Google Joseph Scrimshaw, finish your monsters, and uh, it will pop right up. That's it for me, Ken. There you go. That's it for Joseph, Jennifer, uh, me, and of course, uh, Chief Chirper. He's got mentioned in the show, so we got to pay our respects on the way out. We'll see you next time here on Force Center.